Father is in me. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that we do have the freedom to come and worship you freely in this country without persecution. Lord, open our ears to hear your words, Lord. Help us to be faithful and and to spur one another to good works. Lord, help us to hide your word in our heart that we don't sin against you. Help us to teach the children that we have the opportunity and want us with fervency and with love. And help us to live lives that, that show that we are believers, Lord, not that we just profess with our tongues, but, Lord, we believe in our heart and it affects our mind and our heart and our attitude as we serve you, Lord. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this sermon, Alive or Not?, you know, Sherry usually gets up before me every day, and if she doesn't get up and she's just laying there in bed, she's so still and everything. How I have to tell if she's alive or not is I have to look for breath in her, right? Because we can look alive, but many times that's not the case. So I want you to think about that as we're doing our reading and as we're going through here, because you know that we read about them dry bones and how they came and put flesh and tendons on them and everything, but they weren't alive until the uh, breath of the Lord came in them. I've got to find my devotion for today because I want to read that to you too. One of your devotions on October 7th um, was called A Distinguished Life. While Ezekiel was warning people in uh, Judah, Daniel was already a captive in uh, Babylon. And this one was called A Distinguished Life from October 7th. It says, Daniel became distinguished above all other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could not find any grounds for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. As I read that, I thought about First Peter and how we're supposed to be examples. That was from the English Standard Version, so I'm going to read First Peter 3, 8 through 18 in the English Standard Version. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Unity, sympathy, brother love, tender heart, and humbleness. Do not repay evil for evil or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, bless blessings for, to those who are called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lip from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against all those who do evil. And it doesn't matter if you're in Babylon or where you're at. That is the type of life that we're supposed to live. And in Peter's talking about being submissive and even under suffering, not rebelling or anything. He goes on to write in verse 13, Now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. 
Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered, suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may br bring us to God. So Daniel is in captivity already while Ezekiel is doing all the things he's doing and facing all the things that he has faced in his life, even the death of his wife as we read the week before last, and he couldn't even mourn. And Judah is not responding at all. They saw what happened to their sister kingdom, and yet still they won't repent and turn from their ways because they think they're alive, but they're really dead. So this uh, devotional was called a distinguished life. After being seized and taken away into captivity in Babylon, Daniel became a part of a select group of outstanding young Israelite men who were chosen to be part of King Nebuchadnezzar's court. Though he was taken into, in, into exile, given a different name, and distanced by many miles from familiarity and family, through it all Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food and drink. He stood out as a man of integrity amid the moral decay of his time. Daniel distinguished himself. Now, I don't know what your version has or your translation has, but the ESV said that then Daniel disti became distinguished above all the other high officials. That means he did something that others saw, and he was distinguished in his life. He was different in his life. Now, that, that word is only used one time in the Old Testament. It's hard to get a full grasp of what it means, but it's different. It's set apart. It's uh, distinguished from someone else, but it gives the answer for that in the next thing. It says, because an excellent spirit was in him, because he was driven by the Spirit of God, the breath of God that drove his life, that patterned what his life would be like, regardless of the circumstances around him, regardless of what he would suffer for it. Daniel distinguished himself with the structure of the government he served by the quality of his life. Over many years, his loyalty proved to be unquestionable, he was a man of consistency, which he displayed through a succession of kingdoms. He had an extraordinary capacity for facing and overcoming difficulties, as well as God-given wisdom, which enabled him to provide counsel that would alter the course of human history. While the governmental positions that Daniel occupied were susceptible to corruption, he distinguished himself by saying not no to all the kinds of dishonesty, he was neither negligent nor unethical, nor was there a gap between his public activities and his private life. He was blameless in the eyes of his fellow men. Even colleagues who were jealous and despised him because of his distinctiveness could find no ground for complaint. Filled with envy, these officials eventually decided to plot against Daniel. They didn't like his unswerving commitment to God or the fact that he occupied a position of power. They couldn't handle the way that he, dis that he displayed through his life an unshakable conviction regarding the might and purity of God. Holy living often brings that kind of disdain. Daniel was framed not because he was a bad fellow, but because he stood for the truth. He loved what God loves. He lived it out. Is your life marked by a similar conviction? So as we read this week, and as we continue to read, you'll finish up Daniel and you'll finish up John this week. Do you think about the uh, Old Testament, how it points to Jesus Christ, and the constant stiff-necked, rebellious attitude uh, of adulterous loves for this world rather than God? And the warnings that we have over and over, and Jesus Christ commands to you, especially to love. John is the perfect example because he wanted to rain down fire from heaven, but later he's known as the disciple of love. Last week I asked you what a child of God looks like, and I led that into being a child of light because we are here to be light in this world just as Jesus is light in this world. They were to look different, were to shine, stamping out the darkness. I even gave you a couple questions to ponder, and they were difficult questions. I wanted to bring up something that you wouldn't normally think about because it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I would just do this. But the examples that I gave was one was if a man was his income, I'm going to say it again in case you weren't here, and he was up for promotion and he deserved the promotion. He did a good job. He'd been there all this time. He was the first one in line, but there was somebody else there that, 
that really needed that promotion more than him. Really needed it. And you're taken care of and you trust God. Would you stand down and let that other person have that promotion? I mean, that's going to the extreme. But do you have that type of love for God and love for others and the faith that you have that can move mountains? Do you have that? And another one I gave was if you had got, ladies got a, your brand new car and you got your vacation all planned out and this mother didn't have any transportation and needed to take her children wherever it was to the doctor, whatever, would you give her a car? Would you give up your vacation? What would you do? Or would you just go on, as James says, and says, be well and be fed, be blessed, see ya. How do we live our life? And the reason I put extremes is so you can think about what would you do and not do? Because that young rich ruler that came up to Jesus that day did not expect to walk away from Jesus. But when Jesus told him, he said, you've obeyed the laws and everything, but you lack one thing to be complete. That's to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come back and follow me. He wasn't willing to do that. So I ask you what you're not willing to do because that's still darkness that resides in you, and you may appear to have life, but you may not have the life in you, especially that Jesus died to give you. Light shines. It extinguishes the darkness. That is what it is supposed to do. And the darker the times, the, light, the brighter the light needs to be, correct? And we see the example in Daniel with that, with that devotion. Do you know what the definition of a lumen is? I thought I'd use a little science here. A unit of luminous flux in the international system of units that is equal to the amount of light given out through a solid angle by a source of one candela intensity radiating equal in all directions. Did you get it? In short, it means brightness. You are to shine. You don't have to figure out how, everything else. You certainly don't need to, to worry about yourself. You need to be plugged into the power which comes through Jesus Christ. Oh, we got one of those I am's. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We also have I am the vine and you are the branches. There is no way that you're going to have the power to produce the fruit unless you're plugged into Jesus. And that power is the Holy Spirit living in your life by a spirit that you have that distinguishes you from the rest of the world so that your light shines. You always learn about what's. And what's are a good thing, right? But what's are you doing in your life to make your light shine? Are you letting Jesus do it through you? Did you get that what's? No laughing or anything. Okay. Probably a corny joke. <laughs> so in Ezekiel chapters 27 to 32, Ezekiel continues, continues to prophesy and prophesy and prophesy not only against Judah, but against the powers in this world, the powers of darkness, the powers that God even uses to bring about His will in everything. This world that is so worried about me, myself, and I, and all the things that I have, and all these other gods, rather than being faithful to God Almighty. Paul wrote this to the church at Philippi, Philippians 3, verses 18 and 19. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again with tears... Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destination is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Jesus glorified himself that we might be gloried. Why is this? Because their mind is set on earthly things. So then in Ezekiel chapter 33, there's a little bit of turn in the story. God warns Ezekiel that since he knows the truth, he has to proclaim the truth. That's what he has to do because he is a watchman. He sees the coming destruction. He sees God's wrath coming and he has to warn the people. If he does not warn the people, then their blood is on his hands. You have been given the gospel of Jesus Christ to spread to this world because there is coming a day when Jesus will return and that will be a joyous day for all who believe but it will be a fearful day for those who do not. And Jesus will separate the sheep from the goat. Goats. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 7, God said, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give the warning from me. Hear and obey. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sins, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. 
Now, you can cry out all you want to, but if you're living like them in this world, pursuing the same things, letting the same things be what entice you and motivates you, they're never going to hear your voice. They're going to label you as a hypocrite. But if you live such a distinguished life that they see a difference in you, then as First Peter said, maybe, just maybe, they'll come up and ask you about the hope that you have, and you'll have a chance to, to explain it to them with gentleness and respect. Our job is to live holy lives of light so that we stamp out the darkness and draw people into the light. It's not our job to save. It's our job to live and to shine so that they see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. But God's children refuse to repent. They refuse to turn back and destruction comes. But as we keep reading in Ezekiel, we'll start reading about hope. Hope and more hope. Hope for all of mankind. All of the Old Testament points out to our rebellion and sin so that we can see that we need a Savior and His name is Jesus. And we know that name. In Ezekiel chapter 34, the shepherds of Israel have not taken care of their sheep and they're scattered. In verse 11, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. In verse 23, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. That's referring to Jesus. David is long gone at this point. And he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. In verse 30, Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. I am with them. And that they, the Israelites, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. You should have noticed all through this that the sovereign Lord spoke. The Lord, your God, spoke. That you will know that He is the Lord. That is the purpose so that men know. Creation alone declares the glory of God. But mankind has a choice whether to declare God's glory or not. So are you listening to the shepherd's voice? The one that we know that came that fulfilled Ezekiel's prophecy? Are you loving God with everything you have and loving others? John thir chapter 13. Jesus sets the example and He tells us to love. In verse 33, He says, Little children, I am with you only a little while longer. All of Jesus' talk in the inner room with the, the disciples that are left, the ones that have truly followed Him, that would forsake all to follow after Him, to train and be like the Master, He tells them over and over again to love. And He tells them over and over again they can't do it on their own. It is better for them that He goes away so that the Holy Spirit will come. So how is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Is it foreign? Or is He giving you the breath that makes you move and breathe and exist and live for Jesus? You're born again by the Spirit, but the Spirit also guides you into all truth, comforts you, does all of these things. I've got a list a mile long I can give you. I might do that next week of the things, verses that say what the Holy Spirit does for us as believers. And Jesus said, I won't leave you as orphans. I'll never forsake you. It's better if I go away and the Holy Spirit comes. Little children, I am only with you a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Since I am going back to heaven, then you must, I'm adding that in there, this new commandment I give you, love one another. It's not new, it's old, it's from the beginning of time to love God. It's in the Ten Commandments and everything else. We see God's love. But here's the new standard. As I have loved you, so you also must, there's the must that I implied earlier, love one another. Without it, you're simply a clanging gong and a noisy symbol, Paul says. You can make all this noise you want to, but without love, it's meaningless. Even if you have the faith that can move mountains, but you don't have love, it is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Verse 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So we continue reading in John chapter 14 through 1922, and you see the continued inner room discussions all the way up to the passion of Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross. And that's where you'll pick up in your reading today. So I want to go through a little bit of what we read there in John. In John chapter 14, because Jesus is going away, He tells His disciples this. This is how John 14 begins. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
Because I would want to think that it's better for Jesus to be here with me. And if he goes away, how am I ever going to live on my own? He's going to be gone. I, I can't refer to him and pray to, or speak to him. Yeah, I can. I have an advocate to the Father. Uh, the veil has been taken away. I am a priest. I've got direct access so that I can offer spiritual sacrifices that lead others to God. Oh, and I've got the comforter, another advocate here with me now to comfort me, to guide me into all truth, to continue to remind me about the things that Jesus taught and did so that I have them in my life. So as I seek more and more to throw these things away that I used to go after and let the Holy Spirit fill me, the more that I might be distinguished above men like uh, Daniel was. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Have faith in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. Well, you know what happens next. They say, no, we don't. Yes, you do. You know that Jesus came from the Father, and he came to earth. He's going back to the Father, and he said he's going to prepare a place, and he's going to come back and take you to be with him. You don't have to know all the rest of the details. You're not going to know the rest of the details. What you know is that Jesus Christ finished his work and he gave you work to do until he comes back. Are you doing that work? And you can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit making you into a child of light and a child of love. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And here we get the answer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So now are you thinking about the other I am's that Jesus is? Are you hearing the shepherd's voice? Do you believe he is the resurrection and the life? Is he the bread of life for you? Are you consuming him through his word and through the spirit so that you will be like him? Jesus goes on to talk about love and an obedient life. And since he's going away, we need help. The Holy Spirit, not a power, not a thing, God Himself, He living in you. The world doesn't know Him, but you know Him. The world refuses to believe. It's a time to worship. As Sherry said, I didn't give her those voice, verses again. She picked them out to worship in spirit and in truth. And the Holy Spirit will guide you to all truth. So is the Holy Spirit leading you to live differently in this world, to be like Jesus. Learning to love God more and more for the grace upon grace upon grace, the love that He has for you so that you can share that love with others. Someone even better to help us. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. But I can't. I am, I am such a sinful man. How can I ever keep your commands? Well, the Spirit of truth dwelling in us will lead me there, won't he? Because the next verse gives us the answer, verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. If you're stuck in verse 15 and you say, if you love me, keep my commands, and you say, I'll do it, you're just like that young rich ruler who thought he had everything, but then walked away from Jesus that day because he didn't have the love that he needed to have in his heart, the faith that he needed to have. He had his firm foundation built upon sinking sand and the things he had and the prestige that he had, his health, whatever things it was. And he walked away from Jesus. So I know that if I love Jesus, I do, that I am a sinful man and I will stay in my sinful ways unless he helps me. And God, and Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will send you another advocate. I will give you another advocate. That means someone to come alongside you for the mission that you have to proclaim to, you, to God that you are his child and to help you along the way until your job is done. That's the definition. Uh, to help you and to be with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. You were born again by the Spirit of God, and He will guide you into all maturity, for He lives with you and will be in you every step of the way and transforming you along each and every step of the way. Are you thinking about the fruits of the Spirit now? Are you thinking about how you can walk in step with the Spirit? Verse 25, 
All this I have spoken while I was still with you. Jesus is leaving them and he is giving them the advice, the comfort, the instructions they need. But, I've spoken all these things while I was here, but now the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will be the one that will teach you all things. More than what I taught in the years that I was with you, in three years of ministry, with them, or however long it was, the Holy Spirit's going to be with them for the rest of their life, teaching them, guiding them into all truth. And, I, and, and the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that I have said to you. So as you read and study God's Word, the Word that became flesh, the flesh of Jesus, you study and you ask the Spirit, the more that the Spirit will guide you and reveal you into all truth. So the next thing Jesus says is, Peace I leave you. There's where you can be peaceful, even if you're stuck in Babylon captivity and you don't know what's going on, whether things are good or whether all of a sudden you're thrown into the lion's den. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, those things that you think you find peace in. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In John 15, we have the final seventh I am statement of Jesus. It starts in the very first verse. I am the true vine. The vine is what's growing, connected in it's what has life, and the branches come off of that. Without the, the vine, there would be no branches. Without the vine, there wouldn't be any branches. Then for there wouldn't be any fruit coming off the branches, would there? Pretty simple to figure out. I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. Okay, now we're getting a little more complex. So what does that mean? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. That's not a bad thing. Oh, sometimes the cutting is painful, but go prune your bush and see what happens to it. It comes back with more life to produce more. Huh. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So then when he's through pruning you, and he has sent the advocate to be with you forever and to guide you into all truth, then you're a... a full of fruit. All of these uh, branches are producing fruit. You are already clean. Uh, I don't know if I finished too. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears no fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. I did. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now, remain in me, experience that life, remain in Jesus, as I also remain in you. He's not going to leave or forsake us. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in the vine. I think there's a purpose here in Gardening 101 that we're supposed to produce fruit. Without producing fruit, we might have the appearance of being alive again. That plant is alive and everything, but if it's not producing fruit, it's not alive in the way God intended it to be. You might pass through the fire. But will you have done the life that God has called you to be? Will you be Jesus' hands and feet? Are you listening to His commands? Are you loving the Lord your God with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself? So Jesus goes on to say, I am the vine and you are the branches. Do you understand this concept? If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Not just fruit, but much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. Oh, wait a minute now. Hmm. That should be sobering if I think I have life. Because I'm going back to, again, if they don't produce fruit, then they're going to be cut off. If I cut off, I'm still in Jesus, and I can produce more fruit. But if I'm the part that's cut off and thrown away, then what happens? I'm thrown into the fire. Well, I never thought that when I was in the... the vine the whole time I thought I was doing fine but instead of when I was pruned instead of being the part that stayed and was alive and produced more fruit I wound up being the one that was thrown away there's a thin line there between Judas and Peter isn't there this is to my father's okay I did jump my head this time verse 7 if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you that's a pretty big statement. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more at the end. This is to my Father's glory <clears throat> that you bear much fruit. What does that do? 
showing yourselves to be my disciples. You will have the confidence and peace that surpasses all understanding and others will see it too. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. There we get it repeated again. And then Jesus expounds upon it even more. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend, which again you know that Jesus Christ did for you. Verse 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Verse 27, and you also must testify. Now, I didn't say the rest of that verse. I don't want you to concentrate on that that was for the 11 that were there. No, that's for each and every one. And we'll learn that as we get into chapter 17 when Jesus prays. That's for everyone that takes up the, the mantle of faith and wants to become a disciple. Jesus, again, called you disciples and brothers. The word Christian wasn't used till we started living like Christ in this world, and other people saw it. And they were so excited that Barnabas went and grabbed Saul, and they start, spent time there uh, teaching the church. Verse seven, verse 7 of chapter 16 this is the work of the Holy Spirit while Jesus is away doing what? Preparing our home and being an advocate for us. Verse 7 of chapter 16, But very truly I tell you, or truly, truly, or in my words, listen up, it is good for you that I am going away. Wow. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes to you, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Did you spend any time thinking about that? Do you study God's word so you can rightly divide the word of truth? Being an approved workman that's not ashamed on that day? The Holy Spirit, when he comes into the world, the presence in the world, living through us. If He's not living through us, then how is His presence being made known to others? He's a spirit. We know Him and we worship in spirit and truth. They don't know Him. Scripture already said that because they don't believe. So we'll count it to mysticism or happenstance or whatever. Okay? if we don't know, but we know the Holy Spirit, so we should be living like Jesus in the world. He will prove the world wrong about sin. What does that mean? That means that we're holy, set apart, that we knew we were dead once in our sin. I once was blind, but now I see. That's based on how we live. Oh, and righteousness. Righteousness, it says, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Jesus isn't in the world. They can't see His example, but they can see yours. Oh, so are you going to live as you are known that you're a child of God in the right standing with God? That you wear the robes of Jesus' righteousness because you are His example, you are His disciple in the world? Oh, and about judgment. Because of the prince of the world now stands condemned because Jesus died on the cross. Your, pay, your sin debt has been paid and you know that and live it and proclaim it. If you do one without the other, are you like Christ in this world? Or are you just a noisy gong and symbol? You've got to proclaim that Jesus Christ died and you've got to live by the power of the Holy Spirit so that the world can see it. Do you understand these things? Because there is coming a day when Jesus will come back as judge. But Scripture tells us in John that He didn't come to judge this time. He came down to lay down His life that you believe in Him. But the verdict is, is that men love the darkness more than light. That's why we have to shine. Verse 12, I have so much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Did you pick up all this? Oh, this is so wonderful reading all this. I just have to be submissive. I have to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will guide me and comfort me in all, whatever that cross part is. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that He will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit you will receive from me, and He will make known to you. 
And then in John chapter 17, Jesus prays, not only for the 11 disciples, but for us. Verse 9 says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for those that are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. Through them, by the way that they have accepted with faith Jesus Christ, the way that they have condemned the world and lived as a preacher of righteousness. Verse 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they will still be in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, by the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Now, I'm going to say something personal, and I always try to let you know that so it's not just scriptural. The lack of unity in the body of the Christ grieves me because we have so much dysfunctional non-unity in Christ because we can't get along as children of God, be it denominations, be it hurt feelings, be it whatever it is, that it's a crying shame because that is what Jesus prays for right here. The bush has many branches again that produce fruit and they're all connected to one vine. If we have faith in Jesus Christ then we should all get along, shouldn't we? It grieves me. Verse 12, While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name that you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed for destruction that Scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now but I say these things while I'm still in the world. Why did he need to say them while he's still in the world? So you and I could hear them. So we could understand that he was not orphaning us, that the Holy Spirit was coming and it was even better. And we had a mission to do that we can't do on our own. So that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. That you don't worry about anything in this world but pleasing God and you have the authority and the power to do it. Therefore you teach and train up disciples. I have given them your word and the wor word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am. Think about that every day. Do you look like Jesus in the world? My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, because we have a job to do, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message. What if they wouldn't have been faithful? What if your grandparents would have been, wouldn't have been faithful? What if it was your Sunday school teacher that wasn't faithful? Whatever it was. Would you have came to Jesus Christ? Well, I understand <laughs> all the concepts there. But you have a privilege and a responsibility to bear fruit, to live as Christ in this world. And if you don't, you're going to have to answer for it if <laughs> you get to respond. Because that day, remember, many said, Lord, Lord, and he said, depart from me. I do not know you. Oh, they responded, but Jesus said, Depart from me, I don't know you. There was no pleading their case that day. Verse 20, That all of them may be one. There's the unity again. That we shouldn't let things quarrel, anything else. We should know that we're all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. That should be our mission, and nothing should divide us from doing that. Just as you are in me, and I am in you. There's the standard. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent, them, sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one. There it is again as we're one. So what does the world see when Christians can't get along? I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as, I have, as you have loved me. Throughout the book of Ezekiel, you've read constantly what the Sovereign Lord says, and they will know that I am Lord. And Jesus says that by your love, by your unity, that the world will know that God sent His one and only Son. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, we read, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. 
I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And that's what we just read about in John. Oh yeah, there's, there's other things that that talks about when the children of Israel was returned and everything. But it's talking about God's children. They will have a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. A heart that can be molded by whom? The Holy Spirit. And I will put my spirit in you. There's the one doing the, move, the molding. And move you to what? Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws, the holy standard we have for living, so that we do love our neighbors. Which is, Jesus was asked, sum up the laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the Old Testament bears witness to this. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Ironically, the next chapter, ironically, put my little quotations around it, the next chapter of Ezekiel is about them dry bones. Ezekiel doesn't probably know what he's, he gets carried away in the spirit and he probably doesn't have any idea what he's seeing here. But the obvious result is death, death, death. Dried bones that have no life left in them. There is marrow and such in bones. There is life in bones. There was no life in these bones. They were completely dead. Just like um, Lazarus was completely dead. Scripture says he stinketh. I don't remember if that's in the King James or which, which version. Surely, Lord, not. He stinketh by now. Four days dead. These bones were so dry, there is no way there was any sign of life. Ezekiel 37, verse 1, The hand of the Lord was on me, and He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, this low place. It was full of death, full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, only you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones, speak out to these bones, tell them, and say to these dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Not do anything on your own, but hear. And with hear comes what? Obey. And you're not going to do that unless you believe. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones, I will make breath enter you and then you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come to you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Huh. I wonder how people see life in me by the Spirit who lives in me and transforms me into the image of Christ. So I prophesied as I was commanded, verse 7, and as I was prophesying, as I was speaking, I was, I was doing my part, proclaiming the message. There was a noise, a rattling sounds, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. That means they looked alive, don't it? Oh, but, complete opposite, there was no breath in them. You may proclaim Christian all day long. You may do mighty works in His name, even cast out demons. But if you don't know Jesus, if, the, if you're not born again by the Spirit and the Spirit's not living in you, even though you're doing these things, Jesus will say, Depart from me, I don't know you. Verse 9, Then He said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, Son of Man, and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Wait a minute. Prophesy to the breath. Well, didn't Jesus say that I will ask the Father and He will send you the Spirit, the breath of life? And isn't this referring to Son of Man, which Jesus referred to Himself as the Son of Man, and Ezekiel was proclaiming who was coming? Jesus. Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, Son of Man, and say to it, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. These were killed because of whatever, maybe because we sinned against God and we deserve His wrath. But God wants us to live instead, which is exactly why Jesus came, that they may live. So I prophesied as He commanded, 
me and breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet a vast army. Onward Christian soldiers, right? We're an army fighting spiritual battles. Is that how you view it? And is your power the Holy Spirit? Are you fighting that spiritual battle? Have you had the breath of God in you? Or does you just appear to be alive but you're a dead cadaver? I will put my spirit, verse 14, in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. You know where my home is? How about yours? Are you focused on that? Do you believe and are you living? As the one who denied Jesus three times in John chapter 18, Peter would later write this in 1 Peter 2. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, I beg with you, I plead with you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits. Got a little bit more science for you, and then I'm going to close with going back to some scripture. As a basic guide to how many lumens will you need to light a room properly? First, you need to multiply the length and the width of the room to find out the basic square footage of the room. So if a room is 10 by 10, that means it has 100 square feet. So a 100 square foot room will need around 1 to 2,000 lumens in total. Got it? Pretty easy to figure out. How many lumens do you need to light up this dark world? Jesus gave you every bit of the Holy Spirit, held nothing back from you. He said, greater works you will do because I am leaving. So what does that mean? This is the scripture that Mark read this morning. Start out this way in verse 10 of John 14. Don't you believe? There's the first question. Don't you believe? You do or you don't? Because if you do and you have mustard seed sized faith, you can say the mountain jump in the seed and it'll be so. Okay? It's not you, it's God's power through you. Do you think He's limited His power? The same breath that created creation, the same breath that raised Lazarus from the dead, the same breath that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak of my own authority. Rather, rather it is the Father living in me. Jesus being fully God, being fully man. The Father living out in Jesus because He humbled Himself and was obedient to the Father, prayerfully dependent upon God and moved by the power of the Spirit. Who, he is the one doing the work. Believe me then when I say that I am in the Father and the Father's in me. Already we have don't you believe. Okay, you say you do. So now believe then when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. Verse 12, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Huh. We got don't you believe, then believe that the Father is in me, or believe the evidence, either way, have mustard seed faith, and then truly, truly, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, whoever, not limited, not me, <laughs> everyone, will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater than these. Now you talk about a verse that gets taken out of context. Whoo! Because what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the ministry of love that they'll have, that example that he gave of humbling themselves and washing the other's feet or going out in the darkness as Judas did because of his love of money. He said that Peter would deny him three times, but he reinstates Peter. Oops, spoiler alert as you read on, which you know that. Okay? But he says, if you continue on with this mission that you've been training for, if you're truly my disciple and believe, forsake these other things and go to mission, united with unity to bear fruit, then if you do that, you will do greater works than he's been doing. 
Because of the number of us, because of the power of the Holy Spirit being with us all of our lives, because of God's power moving through to bring Him glory as He brought glory through His Son, now He, glor he brings glory through us as being obedient and will do even greater things. Why? Because I am going to the Father. Because Jesus is going away, it is your responsibility. Die. Deny yourself. Don't worry about what you're going to face. Take up your cross. Don't worry about it. Joyfully go for the cross. It's not shame. It's beauty marks. <laughs> and follow after Jesus. Follow Him forsaking this world. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You're glorifying Jesus by following after Him, being like Jesus, which is what the word Christian means. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The Father will do it. The Son will do it. Doesn't that mean the Spirit will do it through you? If you love me, keep my commands, which I've already said I can't do on my own, so I've got to bring in the third part. I've got to bring in the, the Spirit. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you, to help you do these things that I've been doing, and even greater things. And He will be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him. Oh, I have you though. Are you born again and are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? They can't accept Him because they don't see Him or know Him. You worship the Father as Sherry did in this first scripture in spirit and in truth, which is what the Father is looking for. But you know Him for He lives with you and He is in you. He won't forsake you and He will empower you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. And what else? He will return for us in the flesh because He's going to prepare a place for us so when that time is right, He will come back and you will be forever with Him. That sounds like a mission I'd like to sign up for. How about you? But I don't have the power. It's not about me whatsoever. It's about me dying so that He can live through me. Just as Daniel lived a distinguished life, so I ask you again, you got all that science about lumens and everything. How brightly are you shining? Because you're plugged into an unlimited power source so that you will shine before men. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty God worthy of our praise, our glory, and our honor. We thank you for your passion, for your faithfulness, for your continued long-suffering with us, Lord, in our stiff-necked rebellion. Lord, help us to realize the place that we are in your salvation story, that the things that Daniel and Ezekiel only hoped for, we've seen in reality of Jesus Christ, and together working with their uh, lives, Lord, and their testimony, that we will not only see the f reality of Jesus Christ coming to die for our sins, but we'll see the reality of Jesus Christ reigning in this world through us. And that together we'll see an eternity with you through what Jesus Christ has done when He returns. Father, I just thank you and praise you for this church. I pray a special empowering of the Spirit to be like you in this world. Give us the peace that surpasses all understanding that Jesus does give us. Give us joy that Jesus had for setting forth, looking at the cross, Father, and help us to follow after Jesus as we let Jesus turn us into fishers of men. We pray this in His name. Amen. You going to sing them bones, them bones, them dry bones? <laughs>